Welcome. Um, my name is uh, Marty Eichenbaum, and at least for this year, I'm the director of the Crown Family Center for Jewish and Israel Studies at Northwestern. Uh, what our center is about, we're committed to studying Jews, Judaism, Jewish history, and, uh, and Israel. Uh, let me say we're proud to host a variety of events which faculty, students, and the broader community uh, are, 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 are warmly welcome to. And our next event is on November 16th, when we'll be co-hosting with the JCC a live podcast of Israel Stories. If you're not subscribing to Israel Stories, do yourself a favor, subscribe. It's, it's just a marvelous way to experience and understand modern Israel as a living, breathing, real, complex entity, it, not the stereotype that emerges from yesterday's headlines or a sequence of uh, tour bus stops. And if you have problems hooking up to your car, I'm even willing to volunteer and help you do it. So you can play it on your commute. Uh, tonight, though, uh, we're delighted at the opportunity to meet and learn from Meir Shalev, uh, the, 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 the uh, acclaimed uh, Israeli author and journalist. The lecture series that we want to acknowledge is paid for uh, with a gift from the friends of Lester and Renee Crown and designed to honor them and, and the Crown Center. Now, as some of you may know, um, I'm actually the Charles Moskos Professor of Economics. And while being an economist is really a big plus in many contexts, it's important to know one's limitations. So to introduce you to Mayer and tonight's events, I'm going to turn to Claire Sufren, who is the Assistant Director of Jewish Studies and an accomplished scholar in her own right. And I do that because tonight's events is about matters of the soul, uh, not the pocketbook. So, Claire. <laughs> Okay, uh, thank you, Marty. Can people hear, hear okay? Okay, we have actually three options for microphones, so if at any point you can't hear, we can try another option. Um, I'll start by saying I know nothing about economics, um, but a thing or two about uh, modern Judaism. So I can tell you that when it comes to studying the rise of Zionism with students, and I include both undergraduate students and adults attending classes in, the, in various community settings, when studying the rise of Zionism, I generally find or consistently find that one of the most challenging things for students to understand is the idea that a renewal or a renaissance of Jewish culture, of a modern Jewish culture, should be rooted in the Hebrew Bible. Right? The, the claim that modern culture can come from the roots of the Hebrew Bible. In particular, I often find students questioning whether the Bible can give rise to anything besides religion. And by religion, they usually mean rituals, synagogue life, rabbis, teaching from ancient books. Zionism, they think of as a contrast to religion, and for the most part, rightly so. Something predominantly secular, something largely, though again, not entirely rejected by more traditional Jews in part because of its secularism. Shouldn't these Zionists be distanced from the Bible? But then they read a text by Achad Ha'am, the Russian-born leader of the Chibat Zion movement in the late 19th century, and the Zionist thinker who is most closely associated with what today we call cultural or spiritual Zionism. They will easily, these students, some of you have perhaps been a student like this at one point. These students will easily agree with Ha'am when he says that the Bible is evidence that the ancestors of today's Jews lived within a thriving culture that they created and that is preserved for us within the Bible. But then Ha'am insists that as long as Jews have the Bible, they have the potential to be culturally and artistically productive. And then my students will ask, isn't the Bible a religious text? Isn't it useful only for religious purposes? Isn't it eternal, by which they mean finished, done, completed, set for all times? How could it be the foundation of something new and creative? If Ha'am could know the writing of tonight's speaker, Mayor Shalev, I think he would be pleased. Shalev's 2011 book, Breshit, which is named in Hebrew after the first book of the Bible, and thus translated into English as beginnings. The book sets out to chronicle all of the firsts of the Bible, the first love, the first dream, the first king, and so on and so forth. But 
I, a little bit of a spoiler alert, this framework of the first is really only a ruse because there are many firsts that are mentioned, but really the book is a collection of Shalev's appreciation of the Bible as a piece of literature. It is one author admiring the techniques of another. Shalev pays particular attention to the first two kings of the Israelites, Saul, or Shaul in Hebrew, and David, David. No reader will be surprised after he admits in a very quick little paragraph that his two parents, his mother and father, had an ongoing argument about which was the better of the two kings. And so we have a son who continues to explore them. He, in this book, is particularly fascinated by David's downfall after the king sees the beautiful Bathsheba bathing, sends for her, impregnates her, and ultimately arranges for her husband's death. Shalev writes, quote, our great literary prophets have contributed long and beautiful passages to the canons of Jewish ethics, but one cannot forget the brief, piercing outcries of two prophets who preceded them. You are the man. Nathan the prophet accused King David in the sinful episode of Uriah and Bathsheba. A great and brave cry that echoes in the hearts of readers to this day. Elsewhere in the book, he comments, quote, one needs considerable literary skill to write like this, to characterize a speaker through his speech alone, its tone and content. Shalev's appreciation for the Bible as literature, as the product of a careful, intelligent, talented author, his appreciation for the Bible is apparent as well in his own novels, which indeed fulfill that charge of creating a new Jewish culture on the foundation of the oldest layers of Jewish culture, namely the Bible. The title of his most recent novel, Two She-Bears, is itself a biblical allusion, an allusion to an episode in which two bears emerge from a forest to protect the reputation of the prophet Elisha. Joseph appears by name, Jacob by name, and others, but all for the purpose of adding sharpness to the characters in this book's central family, the Tavori family, which lives for generations on a moshav, a settlement founded in the days of the Chalutzim, the early uh, Zionist pioneers. The book picks up as well key tensions of the Hebrew Bible, love both pure and sinful, and the lengths to which it will drive people, the nature of friendship, the nature of relationships between families across generations and within families and within generations. And ultimately, the book explores what happens when a child is alone with his father out in the desert, yachtav, in togetherness. And I'll comment as an aside that the translation into English, I think, is very, very good, especially for a book that looks so deeply at the actual words and their meaning and the structure of the grammar. Even in English, it comes across what Shalev is up to. Our speaker tonight, Mayor Shalev, was born just two months after the birth of the state of Israel in Israel's first moshav. He later moved to Jerusalem, where according to some biographies, and you can tell me whether it's correct or not, he may still live. Others uh, have him somewhere else. Um, he was a student of psychology as a university student and began working in radio and TV. Shalev published his first novel, some of you may know it, The Blue Mountain in 1988 publishing since then another eight novels, six works of nonfiction, and children's books as well. His novel, A Pigeon and a Boy, won the National Jewish Book Award, which is certainly uh, probably the most well-known award for Jewish literature in our country. It is one of many that he has won, and I will note um, in particular that he's won awards from societies for ornithology, for the study of birds, the study of bugs, um, Israeli societies, it's a recognition of his deep love and appreciation for the land of Israel um, and for the place where he has rooted his fiction um, and where the Bible, of course, as well happens. He's noted, uh, many of his uh, appreciators note that his fiction is not overtly political in, uh, in any way. For those who want his opinions on politics, they have the option of reading a weekly column in Yediot Achronot. So in a moment, I will hand over uh, the podium, the microphone uh, to our speaker. But before I do, just a quick note about tonight's program. After we hear from Mayor Shalev, we will invite him over to one of these chairs where he will, where he will be joined by my colleague, Professor Eli Rechas, 
uh, who will guide uh, him through an interview, conversation, something of that, of that sort. Professor Rechas is the Crown Visiting Professor in Israel Studies and Associate Director for Israel Studies at Northwestern University. And if you know anything about universities, you know that the title visiting can be a little misleading. We've had the pleasure of having Eli here with us for many years where he has really helped us to grow um, our Israel Studies uh, program within the Crown Family Center. As Marty, um, oh, before actually before I say that, I will note as well that uh, Shalev's books, several of them will be for sale in the lobby afterwards, I believe with an option for a signature as well. And uh, for those of you who want to look even beyond tonight, I will echo uh, Marty's invitation to join us for Israel Story Live uh, next Wednesday night. And so with no further delay, it is my pleasure to welcome Mayor Shalev to Northwestern. Thank you. Thank you for inviting me uh, uh, to this place and to this uh, audience. I'll be talking a little about my new novel here uh, in America, Two She-Bears. This is the way the King James Version translates uh, the expression Shtaim Dubim uh, from the Bible, from the Hebrew Bible. Shtaim Dubim is a grammatical mistake. Uh, it makes me personally happy to see that, that even biblical authors made mistakes in, in Hebrew uh, because we tend to do it uh, all the time when we are speaking. It's a very elusive uh, uh, language and we make a lot of mistakes. But Shtaim Dubim in the Bible is a kind of a mistake, which, which is a mistake, but still I find it very tempting, very inspiring because there is something special about it. Uh, there was something about the biblical bear, and you know we had bears in, in Israel at the biblical times. Uh, we had three animals, as a matter of fact, who could kill uh, people in, in biblical times. They're all in one uh, verse in the book of Amos. Kasher Yanus Ish Mipnei Ha'ari, as a man who runs away from the lion, uh, and the bear will uh, tackle him. And when he runs to his house and put his hand against the wall, he will be bitten by the snake. So these are, this is, the, of course, uh, the Jewish way of looking at the world, but still it is also, it is also uh, uh, the prophet put the three dangerous animals in one, in one uh, uh, sentence. Today we have only the snake, as uh, uh, lions and bears uh, are not in Israel anymore, but we still have one to three casualties of uh, usually vipers in Israel every year. And in this book, there is also a victim of a snake, uh, a child which is bitten by a snake in the desert, and it will uh, 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 start uh, uh, a process of events that are documented uh, in the book. About uh, six or five years ago, I was invited to a family in uh, a Moshava in, in Israel, uh, who invited me to have with them a special dish known in Polish as nushki. It means a little leg in, in Polish. In Ukrainian as Cholodiet, it means cold. In English, aspic. In Russian, pcha. And in Hebrew, regel krusha, which is an ugly name. Uh, I must tell you, this dish is the hardcore of Ashkenazi cuisine. <laughs> the Sephardic people do not eat it at all. And it, for them, it's one of the signs that Ashkenazi people should not be related gastronomically at all. <laughs> uh, um, and even among Ashkenazi people, only the real, the real uh, uh, Hasidim of Ashkenazi food will eat it. I'm one of them. And one day I wrote it in, in the paper that I like this dish. So this family, uh, via a, a friend, 
sent me an invitation to come and eat their regal uh, krusha, uh, their nushki, uh, 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 saying that it's about time I should taste the real nushki, not the one I get from my parents or from my uh, uh, grandmother. So I went there. And uh, after we had uh, their, uh, uh, their uh, uh, aspic, which was very mediocre, if I, I, I may say, uh, the daughter of the, of, the, of the father, the father was an 86 years old man, his daughter, my age, uh, rose up and she said, we are very happy to have Meir as our guest. And since we know his books and we know his style, there is a story I want to tell him because I feel this story may suit his, his way of, of writing. Maybe he will use it in his next novel. And then her father, the old, very big person, rose up to his feet and said, and I quote, I know what you, are going to, what you want to tell him. Please sit down. Shut up, he said, shut up to his 60-something years old uh, daughter. This story should not be told to anyone. And uh, uh, I don't want you to tell it uh, uh, this time. There are people here who shouldn't know this story. So she sat down and shut up. Uh, but the lady who sat next to me, uh, I saw that she, she was smiling. This is the lady that invited me. So I whispered in her ear, do you know the story too? <laughs> she said, yes. So I said, can you, can you whisper the story in my ear? And she did. And this is a story about a man from the same Oshava who in the early uh, 1920s, murdered the lover of his wife, uh, made it look as a suicide. Uh, he received the cooperation of the whole Moshava. Uh, there was a British policeman who came to investigate, but they all convinced him it was a, a suicide. I guess the British policeman was also not very keen about solving the mystery, you know. Let the natives kill each other, who, who cares? And uh, this story was suppressed and hidden. And also another story that came later, I don't want to talk about this. It will be a, a spoiler. Um, and she wanted to tell me this story. Now, killing the lover of your wife is not something which is typical only to this Moshava in Israel. It happened in other places in Israel. It happened in America. It happened in Zambia, in Norway. Everywhere you will always find a man who is angry enough and um, manly enough uh, to do such, uh, such things. And uh, uh, still the story attracted me. I was in the middle of writing the story of the father whose son was bitten by the snake in the desert and he blamed himself for that. But I felt that this story could fit in as well uh, uh, to my book, and I started investigating and researching uh, in a very low-profile way because I didn't want the people of the Moshava to know that I'm sniffing uh, uh, into this uh, uh, plot. I, I, I took measures of, of, uh, of, of carefulness because I, I knew the place and I knew the family. Uh, later, by the way, when the book was published, I was warned not to to get near this place uh, at all. But about half a year later, or a few months later, I got a phone call from a friend who served with me in the army 50 years ago, whom I didn't see for these 50 years. Uh, and he said, listen, I read your last book, and I think we should meet and have a talk. I said, uh, OK, I, I will gladly meet you. I remembered him as a very nice guy. And I said, but what? And he said, I want to, to meet you this week. I said, what, what's so urgent? He said, you don't know what you've done. I am married to the granddaughter of the murderer, he said. <laughs> and there is a big, uh, uh, how would you say, mehuma, Eli? Mehuma in English. Balagan. Okay. <laughs> Chaos. 
chaos in, in the family. So we met and he told me the, the side of the family in this story. I tell you all that because sometimes I hear a, a, a story that may affect the, the writing of a book I'm writing at, at the same time. Usually it happens when I, when I go to meet people whom I want to ask about uh, different issues or professions or uh, periods of times in our history that will help me write my book. For example, when I wrote uh, A Pigeon and the Boy, I had to learn how to train homing pigeons, what to feed them. I just want to, to, to say this, that I, I never held the homing pigeon in my hand and I never raised the homing pigeons, but I wanted to give the book a, a, a reliable a, a kind of atmosphere. So that, that, that somebody who knows about homing pigeons will not think that my narrator is a complete ignorant. So I met this man who was uh, 83 years old. This one is better. Thank you. Ooh. <laughs> You should just, you should tell me that I should switch it on, that's all. It's uh... <laughs> So I came to this man who was 83 years old and he was handling homing pigeons first for the Haganah, the paramilitary organization in Israel, and then for the Israeli army. The Israeli army employed homing pigeons till 1957, by the way. Um, and I started to ask him very professional questions. Uh, how, how, how did he train the, the, the birds? What did he feed them? And so on and so forth. And, and he was a little bored by this conversation. And then he said, listen, I have a nice story to tell you about homing pigeons. Uh, and he blushed. And I looked at this uh, red uh, skin of his, his cheeks and forehead and I thought, usually, Men of 83 do not blush. Uh, either they did everything and saw everything, or they have uh, circulation problems. <laughs> they, they don't blush so often. If this man was blushing so, so nicely, I thought this must be a very good story. And indeed it was. He told me that when he was 21 and he finished his army service, he got as a gift from his commander a pair of homing pigeons, and he said, take these two pigeons and you may start your own loft of, of homing pigeons. Maybe you can sell them and, and so on. When, because he was a student and he needed the money. And he started a, li a little business of, of uh, growing homing pigeons. And he said, and one day, uh, a couple from a kibbutz in the north of Israel came to me and they wanted to buy a, a pair of, uh, of pigeons. And he said, I sold them a male and a female. And I told them, you must be very careful to close the door of the loft of these two pigeons because if they go out, immediately they will fly back to me. This is what homing pigeons are doing. They go home. <laughs> and, and, and this is their home. My place is their home. And they went to their kibbutz. And uh, a week later, one of the pigeons came back to, to this man. Uh, the day later, uh, uh, the woman arrived. It was in the early 50s. Going by bus from the upper Galilee to the center of Israel was a, a, a real task. She came very tired, very hungry, very worried what happened to the pigeon. And he said, it's okay, the pigeon is here, but you should have been more careful and closed the door and he gave her something to eat and drink and they had a little chat and she took the pigeon and he said again, don't remember, lock the door, and she went away. Uh, ten days later, the pigeon appeared again. Uh, the woman came a day later, tired, worried, but, but uh, with a better mood uh, this time, and, and uh, he made her something to eat, and they sat down and had a drink, and it was a lovely conversation, not only about pigeons. And then he said, you must be very careful, close the door, to, gave her the pigeon, she went back. Four days later, the pigeon appeared again, and, then, and the man blushed again and said, 
And then I understood. <laughs> she opens the door deliberately. Uh, she wants to come and visit me. And uh, this, was the, this was the whole story. She, she, they had this forbidden love affair going on for about a year and a half. Every now and then she would open the door. Uh, her husband, who was a very busy man in the kibbutz movement, uh, said, go, go, I'm, I don't have time for this. Go to this man and bring the, the, the pigeon back, which she happily did. And uh, this was the story he, he told me. I had mixed feelings about this story. Not, um, not from the moral point of view. I, I liked it, I must admit. I really liked this story. I had mixed feelings because uh, first I was very happy for receiving such a beautiful story uh, from somebody. Uh, usually writers like to, to get stories from other sources. Uh, somebody said uh, uh, telling a writer a good story is like hugging a pickpocket. He will, he will steal it uh, immediately, which I intend, intended to do. And the, but the other side was that I, I, I really felt sorry and I even blamed myself for not being able to invent this story myself. <laughs> he told me the story and I said to myself, you should have thought about it yourself. But I took the story, I came back home and I said to myself, I will finish the story about the man who builds himself a new home and have a love affair with his uh, female contractor and everything that in the book of uh, A Pigeon and the Boy. And then I will write another novel about this love affair uh, between the, the, the woman who bought the pigeon and, and the young man who sold her uh, the pigeon. But this did not happen. I, I, I wrote Homing Pigeons. I did not use the story he told me. But all the time I, I felt that it's there in my mind, working as an uh, uh, enzyme or a, a catalysator of the, that, that uh, promotes processes of, of, of creativity without being written, written itself. This is one of the more mysterious uh, aspects of writing that I'm aware of its existence, but I cannot explain it. I don't know how exactly it works. And I tell you all this, by the way, to tell you that the story about this woman and the pigeon uh, was never used. So if one of you want to write a novel <laughs> about it, then, then it, it's free. Um, when I do research for, for uh, a book, I, I interview people who can tell me about their occupation or about their uh, 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 being witnesses to certain events. For example, a pigeon and the boy starts with a description of the battle in the monastery of uh, San Simon in Jerusalem, which was one of the fiercest battles of 1948. So I found and located the, the commander of, of this battle from the, from the uh, Jewish side, and I went to, to interview him about, about the, this battle. He was not a great talker and didn't give me a lot of details. But then I said to him, listen, I just want to tell you in advance that I'm going to introduce a pigeon in, in this battle, even though I know the, there was no homing pigeon in this b battle and no uh, pigeon handler in, in this pigeon. I just want you to know this in advance. So he said, there were so many lies already told about this battle, you can add a pigeon, it's, 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 it's okay. And this is true because when you tell a story, even when you, if you write a, a memoir or you rely on the memories of other people, you must be aware to the phenomena that the human memory is very elusive, is very active, and sometimes the, the mere process of remembering, I think, causes changes in the content of, of, uh, of, of uh, these memories. One of my books is a memoir about my grandmother from the village of Nahalal. The title of this book uh, in, in, in English is My Russian Grandmother and Her American Vacuum Cleaner. 
but the title in Hebrew was, that's how it was. Adavar Ayakacha. Because every time my grandmother started a story, she said, Adavar Ayakacha. This is how it was. Then she would tell the story, and then one of the other relatives will say, it wasn't like that. Zeloayakacha, <laughs> giving his or her uh, uh, version. And we have some kind of an agreement in, in, in the family. When there is a conflict between three, four, five versions of the same story, we choose the most beautiful one and make it the official version. <laughs> it's not, we do not look for the truth. We look for a good story. And when I say for a good story, I, I will give you an, another example. In, in my first novel, a, a Russian novel, Roman Russi, was translated here as, I don't know why, is The Blue Mountain. It's an American invention. Uh, um, there is a, a story about the donkey of my family in the village. I, I just want to, to give you some family background. Uh, I, I, I was born to, to parents who belong to two different sects in, in old Israel. My mother was a daughter of uh, pioneers of the second Aliyah in uh, Nahalal, in the Valley of Jezreel. And my father was a city person from Jerusalem, an intellectual, a poet, a teacher, a, a, a Bible scholar. By the way, in the first uh, uh, Israeli Bible Chidon quiz in 1958, for the 10th year of, of Israel, uh, my father took the second place. Uh, the first one was uh, Amos Chacham, if there are Israelis uh, that will remember. My father was the second. The third one was a Yemenite rabbi by the name of Yichya al Sheikh. And my father said he knew the Bible much better than him and Amos Chacham together, but he did not understand the questions because they were phrased in a way he was not used to, to think. But he said, my father said that if you gave Rabbi al-Sheikh the Bible and ask him to stick a pin through the bet of Bereshit, all through the Bible, he will tell you all the words that the pin will go through. And he was later the model for the famous uh, uh, um, uh, uh, Marachon, sketch of uh, Ari Kanshin and Uri Zohar about the, the Bible quiz. Uh, anyway, um, um, I think I got from the family of my father uh, some knowledge of the Hebrew Bible and some knowledge of literature and the Hebrew language and love to, to all these uh, 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 fields. And from the family of my mother, I uh, got some knowledge of, of nature, of the fauna and the flora of Israel, but also the most beautiful, unbelievable stories that they were making up all the time. Saying, and then telling a story that could never happen. One of the stories was about their donkey, a female donkey. Do, do you have in, in English a word for a female donkey? So you see, in Hebrew we have. There is a chamor, is the male, and a ton is the, is, the, is the female of the donkey. My father told me when I once told him that English is a much bigger language than Hebrew. It has half a million words, and we have only 80,000 or, or 100,000 words. My father said, they have, the English language has 100 words for different kinds of pliers. We have 100 words for stupidity and death. <laughs> each, each language is rich in the fields it is really interested uh, uh, in. Anyway, so we have different words for the female donkey and the male donkey because we are interested in these topics. <laughs> Otherwise, how the Messiah will know which animal he should ride, you know? <laughs> anyway, this donkey was very clever. And uh, my uncle said that this donkey uh, at night uh, 
open, used to open the lock of the cow shed. It was stealing the key from my grandfather in, in the afternoon, and at night it used to open the, the key, go out to the yard, looking, he said, to the left, then to the right. He, he had these movements, and then there was no one. And she, he said, and then she spread its big ears like this, start, ran forward, waving its ears, achieved uh, an elevation, and, and flew off to visit the English king in London <laughs> and discuss with him the future of Zionism. This was, the, this was the story, which I liked a lot. The other story, by the way, was about our neighbor who was a very, very short person, and he could not ride a horse or a donkey, so my uncle said that at night he rides rabbits in, in, the, in, in the field. And I used it later in one of my children's books. So I wrote this story in my first novel in, in Roman Russi. When the book was published, I was uh, invited by my family in the village. I, I have a, a lot of relatives there to a party uh, to celebrate the, my first novel. And my mother said, uh, this is not going to be a party. She, she said, I know my family. This is not going to be a party. It's going to be a court martial. So I will come with you to protect you. And, and she came there with me. And indeed, everybody was very critical about my book. They came with a lot of, uh, of marks in, 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 in each of the copies, blaming me for not telling the truth, or what even worse, for, for telling the truth. <laughs> and then after everybody said what they wanted to say, my, the same uncle, who was now a much older man, uh, stood up and said, I also have a remark. This is about uh, uh, the story about the donkey that flies in the air. I said, what, what can be your remark about this story? So he said in a very severe uh, tone, he said, this story is not true. <laughs> I said, Uncle Menachem, Uncle Menachem, I know it's not true. It's not I also knew it's not true when I was f four years old and you, and you told me this story. I, I suspected it's, it's not true. So he said, you really don't understand what we are talking about. He said, you made a terrible mistake. The donkey didn't fly to London to meet the English king. It flew to Istanbul to meet the Turkish sultan. <laughs> I didn't know what to say to, to that. And then my mother, my guardian, guardian angel, rose up to her feet. Just a second. And she said, wait a minute, to, to her brother. She said, if you read the book carefully, you could see that this uh, flight of the donkey takes place in the early 30s. This is years after the Young Turks Revolution in Turkey. There was no sultan in Istanbul then. <laughs> so Ankel Menachem got really angry. And he said, all we try to do in this then he added an adjective I will not repeat. In this family is to tell good stories. Why do you bother us with your facts, he said. <laughs> this was a, a very good lesson for me. Uh, Uncle Menachem, by the way, never wrote a book. And he was very proud about reading only one book in his whole life, which was the diesel engine and the tractor. This was the, the, the book he read, but he was a great storyteller. And I think that, uh, you know, from time to time, you, you meet a writer or you read a book in which uh, you feel that somebody is trying to teach you, to preach to you, to tell you how to behave, to improve your personality, to become a better person, and bring eternal peace to the world. I do not do all these things in, in, in my literature. 
all I try to do is what Uncle Menachem uh, tried to, uh, to, to, to tell us to do, which is to tell a good story. I think th this is the, the primary uh, obligation of a writer. And then, of course, to tell it in a professional, artistic uh, uh, way that, that the reader will enjoy reading it or will be impressed by reading it. But this is the first thing I try to do. And I hope you will, you will uh, uh, judge me uh, with some kind of mercy and empathy when you read my book, whether I, I did it uh, or not. So I thank you very much for listening. Now we will talk more about the bears. Is this, can you hear me? Yes. Excellent. So thank you, Mayor, for the wonderful stories or storytellings, which uh, are great fun. Having said that, as you said, I want to ask you about um, she bears. But I, I cannot but begin with the Bible. Um, so Claire has mentioned it, and you had mentioned it, and I have a ready question: uh, Where where is this love, embedded love, for the Bible come from? So you mentioned uh, your father in passing, yes. but maybe you can further elaborate on that. I I will tell you an early memory that, that I have. My my father was really a great uh, scholar of of the Bible. He was a secular person. Uh, but he belonged to a generation when, when uh, uh, secular people did l learn, study, and, and, and knew, knew the Bible very well. And I remember myself at the age of uh, six or seven, going with my father to Emek Ha'ela, uh, on the west of Jerusalem, about 30 kilometers west from Jerusalem, to see the place where David slew Goliath with his uh, slingshot. My father believed in teaching the, uh, reading the Bible on location, in the actual place where the, the event took place. And in Israel, you can do, you can learn about uh, King Saul on Mount Gilboa and King David in Emek and Jonah in Jaffa. Um, and he brought with him a friend who could shoot with a stone with the slingshot very professionally. And he brought his big uh, uh, Bible, and we stood there over the, the river, but a river, it's a river at the side of three meters, uh, dry, of course, it's in Israel. Uh, and and uh, he asked me to select uh, five uh, pebbles of stone, as King David did uh, uh, there. And his friend uh, showed me how, how to use the, the slingshot, which he did very professionally and very convincingly, because you could see by the way he shot the stones how accurate you can be uh, using this uh, slingshot and how powerful is the hit. And then my father read the story in a different way than, than the, they later taught, taught me in school, and, and in a different way uh, that uh, from what usually we interpret the story, because usually we take David as the uh, inexperienced, young, weak, little boy fighting against this war hero, a big, experienced uh, 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 warrior. And my father said, this is not the real story. The real story is the fight, is the battle of between the clever and the stupid, between the improviser and the, uh, the, 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 the other side with, with the conception, with the one who walks like a horse in his uh, 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 tread, uh, and the one who finds a different solution. And he explained to me that, that uh, while King Saul thought that he should fight Goliath with the same weapons that Goliath used, the spear and the sword and the shield, David, the young boy, since he was not trained and not educated, but had a bright, fresh mind, understood that the slingshot is the, is the correct weapon for this uh, situation. 
and this this the way he he taught the story was made me really interested in further stories of of the bible and uh, he was always reading us the the stories interpreting the difficult words because many of the biblical words are not understood today and i think this was the this was it's his responsibility okay i just want to tell you that uh, mayor mentioned Rabbi Al Sheikh, who was the third, yeah. took the third place. Yes. And your father took the second place. Yes. And you became an author. And Al Sheikh's son was just appointed as the Inspector General of Israel's police. So, just for the record. Okay. I, I will not comment about that. <laughs> <laughs> But I'm, I'm still with the Bible. And this. Uh, writing about the Bible, does it attract also the younger generation uh, of your readership? I don't know if there is a way to, to measure it or judge it, but I'm sure you're getting uh, some responses. Um, we, we have an educational system in Israel which is really interested in making all the boys and girls in Israel not interested in the Bible. And they are very successful. That's exactly why I'm asked. Most of the kids who finish their, their studies in the Israeli schools are not interested in the Bible anymore. They don't want to see this book anymore because they are taught in a way which is boring, uh, have nothing to do with their uh, way of, of thinking, does not relate to the literary uh, value of, 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 of uh, the stories. By the way, the, the, the Orthodox uh, uh, students of, of, of in Israel also lose interest in the Bible because they finish to study the Bible at the age of uh, five or six and they go on. They have the Gemara uh, uh, to study. So the Bible is not, uh, uh, was not uh, 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 attractive to, to most of the Israelis for many years. But about 25 or 30 years ago, I... I All, must admit that I have some part in this uh, process because I published a book called uh, The Bible for Now, Tanakh Achshav, uh, written in a literary, political, secular uh, uh, way about the Bible. There was more uh, an interest among secular people started to rise about the Bible. Today we have a lot of lectures and studies and, and meetings about the Hebrew Bible, which I think is, is, is very good because, look, this is the... As an author in the Hebrew language, I have this feeling which sometimes is difficult to explain, but I am a part in a very long chain of, of authors in the same language. I think this is the longest dynasty of literature in the world because we can still read the Bible and understand most of what's written there. And, and as a matter of fact, if, if uh, Amos, the, the prophet I mentioned before, would now come into this room, I will give him uh, uh, two shebers in Hebrew, not in English, uh, and tell him, look, I read your book, why don't you read mine? <laughs> and, and he could read my book and understand He will not understand the words uh, uh, car, telephone, computer, uh, and, and, and pickup truck, which are in the book. Uh, but he will understand the words love, uh, revenge, memory, uh, 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 g grief, sorrow, happiness. These are the words that are important for literature. Thank you so much. I, I just have to witness that when I went to uh, elementary school, and I will not speak for myself, but I will say that Bible lessons were not the most popular, uh, to say the least. Yeah. Um, so it's interesting to see whether uh, this has changed. Because I'm sure that there are authors who already give, uh, gave a theory about going back to religion and so forth and so forth. They are also taught in an apologetic manner. I mean, even, even in cases that a biblical character is criticized by the biblical author, then the teacher or the interpreter will try to make his scene smaller or to whitewash it uh, completely. Okay, so let's go back to Shebers. And I, I'm not a literary 
critic, and I have not invented these questions. Okay. So I borrowed them mostly. So I have to say that. So the book deals heavily so. It's saturated with vengeance, revenge, retribution, as well as brutal violence. All the critics begin and almost end with this. So is this a special symbolism? Is this something personal? So you remind me that after the book was published, some of my friends and, and relatives uh, called me and said in a low voices, uh, hello, said, we, I read the book, the new book. Is everything okay? <laughs> uh, something happened? It's trying to be polite. So I must say, I myself am, am not, I'm not an, uh, an aggressive or vengeful uh, person. Uh, but sometimes I, I, I have these little fantasies of revenge, like everybody else in this room. Uh, the revenge is a feeling known to every person. Usually we do not materialize these dreams because we, we are either moralistic people or because we are afraid of the law. But every now and then, we feel that a certain relative of ours could vanish from this world without great sorrow of, of other relatives, for example. Or the driver who almost pushed you from, from, the, from the highway this morning you, you wouldn't be sorry if you, you will roll over to the ditch uh, after two miles. Sometimes, sometimes you, you even find yourself planning a miraculously clever uh, kill of, of, of a person without this man or woman even knowing about it. Now, it is true that in this book there are several brutal scenes of, of revenge, but I think that literature should deal with strong human feelings, with, with, with human behavior, with human actions. Uh, this, this is our, this is, this, this is the field literature is dealing with. The human phenomena, the human behavior, not as psychologists, but, but as writers, it's, it, it is completely different. And even, even though there is nothing autobiographical in, in this book, uh, I always found revenge as a very tempting feeling to deal with in a literary manner. And when I started to write this book, I said to myself, it's about time I should go to, to an extreme. You know, when they check you, uh, for example, when they check your heart uh, uh, and they artificially increase the pace of your heart by running on, on, on this machine or the treadmill, uh, or when they check your engine in the, in the garage, they also check the engine on high RPMs. And here I thought the human behavior should be checked or described in extreme situations. And while I was writing the book, I thought to myself in, in many cases, what would I do, what would I have done in the same situation I put my characters in? I've never been myself in, in this situation. As I said, I never uh, 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 killed anybody uh, uh, in, in, or harmed anyone uh, as an act of, uh, uh, of revenge. It's a matter of my imagination. So I, I came to conclusions about uh, myself and the, the vengeful uh, phenomena. Uh, I find the blood revenge, nikmat dam or geulat dam as described in, in the Bible, very, very tempting. I, li I like the idea. But again, I'm not going to do it. Uh, hopefully so. You, usually you, you, you do a, a blood revenge when somebody kills a member of your family. And you do the same to his family. This is the whole idea which is still practiced in the Middle East very often. Uh, on the other hand, Killing the lovers of my the lover of my partner, I, I don't I don't see myself taking part in in, in these actions. It's what not about uh, the violence. 
Meir, the violence. So much about revenge. What, what? So much is being written and said about the extreme violence that you, you describe. Where did you take it from? From my imagination, the same, the same, uh, the same, uh, the same place where I take my love stories, the relationships between parents and children in in my stories, from the same place where I take the the, the donkey that flew up in the air. Thank you. I have a, I have a, an imagination and I use it. Thank you. Uh, so I I swear that this question was not planted by the publisher, but. And this is the question. What will attract American audiences in this book? I think if, if any audience will be attracted to this book, it will be the same elements that will attract other people in other places. So it's universal? First, I think local literature is more universal than literature that wanted to become universal. I think that, that local... Uh, local literature is something that any reader anywhere else in the world will find very, very interesting and very attractive. Look, I, I, I will, you, I, I will tell you a story if, if you don't mind. Um, uh, about twenty years ago, when my son was ten years old, uh, we went to the village of uh, Nahalal uh, to my family, and he wanted to drive. Uh, Tractoron, how do you call it in, pardon? Not a tractor, it's a little, uh, the, the small off-road vehicle. Uh, a small tractor, okay, a small tractor. And you know, it's an agricultural area. The boy is only 10 years old, he doesn't have a license, but still, these are only fields and dirt roads. So I said, okay, let, let's, let's drive. Uh, and we took the, the, this vehicle from my cousin, and my son was sitting in the front. It's like the seat of a motorcycle. I sat behind him. I started the engine for him, and I said, let's go to the fields. And he drove. He was very happy and very excited. After about 10 minutes, I looked back, and there was a, a police uh, jeep behind us. And I, I was really uh, startled, because I can lose my own driving license for, for letting a 10 years old uh, boy drive like this. So I told him, listen, there is a police, police officer behind us. Uh, take the first turn into the field and see if he will follow us. Which he did, and the police jeep drove behind us to this, uh, 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 to this field as well. And after two minutes, it started its siren, and I had to stop. And out from the jeep came about 50 years old sergeant, uh, a Druze uh, sergeant. You know the Druze is an Arabic sect in, uh, in Israel. Uh, very, uh, usually the older person, the Druze person have very thick uh, mustaches in a very, combed in a special way. And he had a nice little belly and this big nice mustache and he came out of the jeep, came to me, looked at me with piercing eyes and said, good morning, Mr. Shalev, like this. He, he recognized me, which means either I will be finished twice or I will be excused. But and then he talked to me in a very high-level Hebrew and said, in, in the third person, in a very respectful way, which made me even worry more. And he said, and I see uh, you, you are taking, or he is taking his son to see the landscapes which he described in his book so much. <laughs> so I understood this Druze person is reading my novels. Uh, also a policeman, which is even more surprising. I said, yes, yes, I am, and I show him the landscapes of my childhood. I thought this will be a kind of an escape. And then he said, and I guess you must be thinking, you describe in your books this Moshav Nahalal, and he pointed to our village uh, behind us. I said, yes, in a way, this Moshav, but also some other Moshavim uh, in, in, in the valley. So he said, you are wrong. Roman Roussi, the Blue Mountain, 
describes Daliath el Carmel on the Carmel mountain, which is a Druze village. <laughs> this I liked very much because there is a lot of differences between the Moshav and the Druze village, especially on the ideological aspect. Um, and I, I, I wanted to, I didn't want to argue with him, but I, I said, I take it as a compliment because it shows, I said it to myself and also to him, it shows that a very local uh, literature uh, can be understood and appreciated by people that have nothing to do with the same atmosphere of, of, of our village. And of course, I didn't mean to describe his Druze village on, on the Carmel. In another case, a children's book of mine was translated to Japanese. Uh, it's called My Father Always Embarrasses Me. It's about a, a father who doesn't know how to behave, and, um, and his son is embarrassed. Abo uh, Sebushot Beivrid. And uh, I got two interesting letters from Japan. One, they sent me the, the, uh, the the layouts, the printed pages for proofreadings in Japanese. <laughs> I didn't know what to do. <laughs> but <coughs> somebody told me that if, if I do not react, it will be an insult. So I, I marked randomly a line. <laughs> and I said that I don't like the, the phrasing of this line, and I want it to be corrected. And they sent me back, uh, there were no, no mails, then on a letter saying that they really appreciate my attention and they did correct this, this line. <laughs> but then they sent me a, a, a critical uh, essay that was published about this book in Japan saying that they, they are amazed by the fact that a Western writer could go so deeply into the psychology of the Chinese family, of the Japanese family, which I never wanted to do. <laughs> and I think it does show that the local literature, how, uh, look, when I was 12 years old and I read Huckleberry Finn by Mark Twain, which describes a little town uh, on a big river 150 years before and 10,000 kilometers away, and still I was mesmerized by this book. It shows you that, that first that people are very much all the same around this globe, and the other that, that local literature is really universal. So I don't know if this was already mentioned here, but Mayer's books were translated by now to 26 or 27 yeah. languages. And the most recent one you just told me? Pardon? The most recent one in Bulgaria, wasn't it? In Bulgaria. I'm going to Bulgaria in two weeks for my book, uh, um, A Pigeon and the Boy, in, in Bulgarian. Uh, I, I told the, um, a friend of mine who is, who is from a Bulgarian origin that A Pigeon and the Boy was translated to Bulgaria, and he said, I would have imagined that in Bulgaria they will give it the title A Pigeon with Rice, not, <laughs> not A Pigeon and the Boy, but it's A Pigeon and the Boy in Bulgaria, yes. Okay, so apropos names. Uh, so, Israeli identity is portrayed, this is an academic question, so I have to look at my notes. Israeli identity is portrayed in your book affectionately, as antithesis to the diaspora Jews. So the names given by the grand-grandfather of his uh, sons in the book are Aryeh, Ze'ev, and Dov. Yeah. But here comes the point, what you, and I quote, as opposed to no more Yankel, no more Shmerl, and no more Motl. So you speak also about the, the military service in a... But this is, I, I have to interrupt you for, for a second. This it will is not what, be a second, but it's okay. <laughs> this is what the father said. Not, these are not my words. These are the father's words, because the father of this family is an aggressive uh, person uh, who sees himself as, as a man who defends his land, his family, his people, his rights. And for him, calling his sons uh, by the names of, 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 uh, wild of, of wild animals, 
This is his ideology. Not everything that, that which is written in a book reflects the, the opinion of the writer. So Sometimes the, the characters have also opinions and, and personalities. So this is really an interesting question. How does the reader differentiate between what the hero or the heroine thinks and believes in and with what and between what you think about it. Because I, I was sure that these were your thoughts. I, now you I, come and tell me it's the father. How should I know? Uh, well, uh, I, I hope that, that some other readers are, are able to do it. <laughs> yeah. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. A, a little more practice and you will do it also. I love you too. Okay, so the, the, the end of the question, had I been able to get to it, <laughs> was, would have been, the, the, and, and I naively thought that it was you who were speaking here, um, about this Israeliness that you um, admirably uh, described, now I know it's the father. But when you look at the end product of this Israel um, uh, native, it's not as charming as one would have expected it to be. So there is some dissonance here. There's some, some the, tension in between the, the what was hoped to be or what he would have wanted it to be and what the reality is. Is the, there a dissonance? The, the, the answer is in the personality of the, the woman who is the narrator of, of the book. She tells the story. I am the shadow writer of a woman I made up uh, she tells the story, and the story must be read from her mouth, from her mind, from her feelings. Now, she describes two men in her family who are brutal enough to kill uh, other people as an act of revenge. One is her grandfather, whom she loves a lot because he raised her and her brother. Uh, and the other one is her husband, who takes the blood revenge uh, later. She loves both men, she appreciates both men, she's very critical uh, uh, of both of them. And sometimes she even makes fun of them because her, their masculinity is something which she finds a little ridiculous from time to time. So Isn't she mocking the Israeli uh, image of masculinity? No, she, she mocks her, her husband and her grandfather. I'm, oh, wrong I, again. I, 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 really, I really want to emphasize this point because I, I don't like to write symbolically and I also don't like to read symbolic uh, books. The, this family is, is a unique family, uh, the family which is described in the book. It's, it's a manly, macho uh, uh, family and she, she both appreciates it but, but also ridicules it because she finds it a little ridiculous. Okay, uh, last round of questions, and then we'll open the uh, floor for questions from the um, from the audience. So it pertains to politics. Now, again, I read in in some of your interviews that in your writing you don't go into politics, unlike some other Israeli authors. However, when you're interviewed. Uh, whether in Israel or outside Israel, you definitely relate to politics. So I want to take this opportunity okay. and ask you to say a word about leadership, leadership in Israel. Can you comment on that? I know that. It's, uh, look, are you happy? Uh, are you at, unhappy? At a time, at a time like that, to comment about leadership in Israel, well, it's. Uh, I mean. <laughs> it's, uh, the following question, but it's okay. Still, no, yesterday I, I was in, I'm hopping from one city to another on this tour, and yesterday I was in, a, I gave a lecture in Houston, Texas. The audience came in, it was like a shiva uh, in, in, in the hall. So I felt obliged to, to comfort them uh, in a way. I don't want to interfere with your uh, political internal affairs. I'm sure maybe there are people here who are happy about the results of, of the elections. I don't, I'm not critical about that. I try to be sympathetic and empathetic. 
But I told the, 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 the people in Houston, because they looked so sad, I said, uh, well, as an Israeli citizen, all I can say is, welcome to the club. It's a, it's a, look, for me, leadership, uh, I, I will talk about Israel now. Uh, what I lack in Israeli leadership for many years is, is, is the lack of vision. Of, of a long, uh, of a long, uh, uh, long term look uh, about the future, I have a feeling that uh, 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 Mr. Netanyahu lacks the, the either the ability or the bravery to to uh, to, to imagine the kind of Israel he would like to see in 20 years from now, 40 years from now, even 100 years from now when he will not be a prime minister anymore, even though in his case it's hard to know. <laughs> but, but, but it seems that everything he does is from, from, uh, from today till tomorrow and no further, further than that. And, and I appreciate leadership that has some kind of a long-term vision, uh, long-term planning, and, and, ben uh, and, and uh, like Ben-Gurion, for example. He's or, your hero, or, isn't he? Or, look, uh, Ben-Gurion, if, if he was our leader today, I think I will argue with him about uh, uh, the way he treated the, uh, the press, the media. Uh, he was a, a very Bolshevik. Uh, attitude to, to, towards the media at his time, when he was a prime minister, the Israeli radio had to give his uh, office the the headlines of the news every evening for for to, for critical remarks, uh, for censorship. But this was the this was the the way the the, the leaders behaved at, at those times. But he had the vision and he had the the, the brave heart. The, 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 the bravery to, 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 to perform, to do things, to materialize, materialize his decisions. Okay, I still have a couple, but it's not enough. So I open uh, the floor. Please, 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 I beg of you, short questions, if you may, uh, concise, and there is a mic that uh, Nancy will uh, show around. Yes. You said that uh, you said that uh, it's the father's views and not yours view, and that the woman is the narrator. But isn't in some way a part in most of your books, a part of you that identifies more with one character more than another? Yeah, of, of course. Sometimes I can find myself, for example, this is the first time I wrote a book from, from the mind and the mouth of a woman. All my previous narrators were men. And when I started to do it, and some friends heard about it, or I told them, so they all, especially the women, said, you should switch back to, to your old way of writing from a man's mind, because you will never be able to, to go to these uh, complexities and depths of a soul that women have a limited man like, like you. Uh, uh, but I refuse to do it because I don't think that Ruta, uh, my narrator, represents all womankind on earth. She represents uh, herself. Now, as, as for the, the opinions on the characters, sometimes I feel very close to, to Ruta. But, uh, but uh, the, the, and sometimes I feel close to Eitan, to her husband. Uh, in Roman Rossi, for example, in my first novel, I am much more like the cousin of the narrator than the narrator himself. Uh, in, in every book, I find a character which is more like me than other characters. But I never described myself as one personality in, in any of my books. It's not interesting to write uh, in, such a man, in, in such a way. Okay. Uh, yes, sir? Over there. So who is the Messiah to... To f that Bibi should follow? I, I think Bibi should not follow anyone. He is the leader of Israel. We should follow him. It's his, it's his role to be followed, and not to find somebody else and tell us, follow him. He is the leader. 
So he has to, to, to show us, the public, a path or a direction or a hope in the future towards which we should uh, advance and, 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 and walk, but he fails to do it. He doesn't even show us a right-wing possibility and not a left-wing possibility. The only thing Netanyahu shows us is how to keep his position as a prime minister. This is his main uh, thing as a politician, and I appreciate him very much because he's very successful uh, in, in doing it. Thank you, thank you, sir. One question per person. Yes, sir. I have an, eth I have an ethical question. Um, at the beginning of the evening, they were talking about the Israel Story podcast, which is you know, a, a source of stories. And America is now awash with wonderful, wonderful stories. What are, the ethic, eth, what are the ethics of taking a story and adapting it to your own use? For instance, if I took your story about the pigeon and brought it into my classroom, that would be one consideration. If I took it and, write, and wrote a novel based on it, that would be another consideration. Are there biblical sources that you would steal to develop such a, an ethical position? Look, since you're using the the verb steal, then I understand your, your opinion, but what, you can say borrow, you can say use, you can say uh, uh, rewrite, or, but it is true that many authors are either influenced by other books or by stories they, they heard. For example, it is very, uh, for, for, uh, everybody will forgive a writer who will take the story, for example, of uh, Ulysses uh, coming, Odysseus coming back from the war in Troy to his house. It became a classical literary theme that many authors uh, use. I myself used it a little bit in my second novel, uh, uh, Esau. But then if somebody tells you a story, maybe it will be nice if I call him later and said, look, I like the story you told me. Do you mind if I use it? Um, in a book, but the one thing you are not allowed to do is to is to steal from a book which was already written in in uh, not being influenced but but, but copy uh, uh, a story. One more question, yes sir. Yes sir. You, oh, Mike. Uh, Hi. Well, first, I, I, I must tell modestly and realistically, if translators already translated the, the Odyssey, Shakespeare, and the Bible, then they can translate my books as well. <laughs> this, is, this, is a, this is the one thing that, that, that I, ha I have to say. The other, the other thing is that, uh, luckily enough, I can, I can check only the English translation. So I, 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 if I could read all the other translations, I will really have no time for anything else. So I, I do it only with the English translation. The other translators, uh, if, if there are verses from other literary source or the Bible or, or poetry, I will tell them in advance, look, I took this. This is a quotation from this book or from this uh, chapter in the Bible. Please use the translation of, of your language. A lot of uh, 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 translators ask me about the names of plants and uh, birds and insects, because there are many in my books. But now in the internet, they can find it very easily. Uh, I have different relationships with different translators. For example, my, uh, my Dutch translator is, is very fast. He translates my book so fast that I used to joke about him in, in Holland, in Holland, saying that whenever I get stuck while writing a book, I call my Dutch translator because he already translated the next chapter, 
before I wrote it, and he tells me what's going on so I can follow. Then uh, uh, my, my, my Russian translators, for example, uh, uh, in Israel there are people who can read me both in Russian and in Hebrew, and all of them told me that in Russian my books are much better. So, <laughs> so, uh, so really, it's, uh, I'm very happy about it. Yeah. My last question, what's the next book? Uh, my next book is not uh, a novel, it's, a, it's a non-fiction. It's about my garden. I have a garden around my little house. I have a little house in a little village and, and the garden around it. And I never did gardening. And even today I don't do regular gardening because I grow only wild flowers of, of, of Israel. Uh, cyclamen, anemones, uh, uh, buttercups. Uh, I have other names, but in Hebrew I don't know them uh, in English. And I, I wrote a collection of uh, articles or essays about, it's not a gardening book and it's not a botanical book. It's about myself and my flowers together, uh, uh, feelings, uh, also some, some routines of work, but, um, and, and um, th there will be beautiful illustrations of some of the flowers. So this will be my, my, my next book. It's already translated to German, but it will be published together with the, with the Hebrew, and, and I hope other languages will like it too. Thank, Thank you. you so much. I just want to thank everyone again for joining us tonight, invite you out into the lobby where books are available. I want to thank yes. my colleague Ellie and of course Mayor. Thank you so much.